Okay, so what I want to do is I want to go through a few examples. So what I've done is I just grabbed three websites at random. So Spotify is one, um, a clothing website, another one, Frank and Oak, and BlogTO, a blog for the City of Toronto. And I thought let's let's just look at these and see how they do some of the some of what they do in order to produce the look and feel of what they have. So our focus this week is on things like color, text, um, as opposed to thinking too much about layout. So I'm going to spend a, a good amount of time on layout in the, in the next week when we start talking about using CSS to do layout. But this week I just want to focus on how text and so on gets, gets set up. So let's take a look at this page. So you can see this is a pretty typical landing page where you've got a header. You've actually got two headers or there's like sort of a up here at the top, there's another um, little pop up, a little banner that comes up that has extra information. Um, so we have a menu. When I hover over these links, you can see that the links are changing color. We've got an icon for the, you know, for the main uh, logo for the company. We've got a bunch of text. And you can see that it's text, so I can highlight it. And one of the things that I really want to encourage you to do is in your designs, you want text to be text. So it's tempting, and lots of people, what they do is they make images in order to do text. But I want you to use, the web is amazing for text rendering. So you can see here that all of this is text that can be used, and so that's great. You can copy and paste it, and you can do all the things you can do with text. Text is a very, very powerful interface for working on the web. At the bottom, we've got a footer. The footer has a bunch of different links. Again, you can see as I'm hovering over this, I'm getting, I'm getting different colors and so on. All right, so let's tear this apart. Let's just see what we can learn about this page. I'm going to open up the inspector, and this strategy that we're using here, I want you to do it all the time. So whenever you're out on the web and you see a page and you think, I like this page. This is really interesting, the effect that they're doing here. I want to learn how they did this. Even if you're just curious, like you just want to see, you know, how do how does Nike make its website? How does this company make its website? Just open it up. Open it up and have a look in here and see what kinds of things that um, you can determine by looking at it. Okay, so things that... Things that are interesting to us, um, the first thing that I notice is that in the head, they have a whole bunch of different style sheets that are being loaded, okay? And they're using a trick. So you can see this CSS style sheet here, the way that they're doing the URL, they haven't got a protocol. So they, they say slash slash and then the rest of the website. It doesn't say HTTP colon slash slash or HTTPS colon slash slash. It just has slash slash. This is a common thing that you'll see when people do what's called protocolless URLs. So they will make it possible for this file to load over HTTP or HTTPS. And what's going to happen here is it's going to depend how the page itself is being loaded. So this page is being loaded over um, HTTPS. And so that means that it's going to try and load these style sheets also over HTTPS, tr going to try and load them securely. Sometimes people will do this because uh, in their development environment, the developers will be doing it on HTTP on localhost. And then when they ship it to production, it will switch to HTTPS. And so they'll want to have this so it can work in both scenarios. It's pretty common. You'll see people doing it. And you can see this is something you learn when you open up Spotify's uh, web page, for example. Another thing that's interesting to note here is they have multiple different style sheets. So they're loading those style sheets in the head, but they have multiple style sheets that are responsible for loading different parts of this. And so they're mixing a bunch of different things in order to, to produce this. Kind of interesting. Okay, what else can we see here? How about this top header? So if I go up to this header and click on it, you'll see, let's see if we can find, the header is contained within, like the whole page, the body is here. And you can see that the body has a bunch of different classes on it, page, home page, is logged out, reboot, index homepage, et cetera, et cetera. 
And as I go down, if I get to this, you can see how it is defining that blue color in the background. So if I get rid of this right here, if I get rid of this declaration, you'll see that the background color is this color and that's how it's picking up, um, picking up this blue. Chrome has, and lots of the browsers, Firefox has it, all different browsers have really nice tools for working with the colors. So when you click on a color, you'll get a color picker and you can see more information about the color and you can play around and change, you know, change the color if you wanted to try different colors and so on, okay? So here we are in terms of how the color gets set. What else can we find if we start digging into this? So inside here, there is a class. Here's, here's a link to Canada and presumably to the French version of the website. So I'm on the English version of the website. I wanna to switch to the French version of the website. This is the link that would do it. And you can see that here, they are specifying, for example, the color of the text. Color of the text is supposed to be white. If I don't apply that, you can see that there's another rule earlier on in the CSS, in the cascading effect of the CSS, where all of the rest of their links are supposed to be green. So that's why this turns green all of a sudden instead of white. But if I apply this rule here, you can see it overrides a rule that is further down in the cascade. So you can see that it has a line through it. So whenever you see that line through, you'll know that this particular declaration is being overridden or it's being ignored by the browser because something else is being applied. It's not being used. What else can we see in here? We can see how they're choosing their fonts. So we can see that they're specifying a font family and they're specifying a font size. So you can see that they're dropping the size of the font down a little bit to 12 pixels. If we wanted to, we could say font size is equal to 56 pixels. We could make it really big, right? Obviously that doesn't work with their design. We could say we want it to be 16 pixels, which is the default size that you're often gonna run into on the web. But they're saying, let's drop it down. Let's make it 12 pixels, 12 pixels in size. So that's how come this is small like that. All right, what else have we got in here? How about this text here? How is it done? Let's, let's check it out. So I click on this and you can see that I also have a nice little pop-up here that gives me a quick overview of what I'm looking at. I'm looking at an H1 element. So that makes sense. This is the main heading for the document, music for everyone on this page. That's the most important title. And so that's the largest one. That's the one that they're using an H1 for. But this doesn't look anything like an H1. Like this is an H1 uh, in HTML, right? This is what, this is what their H1 looks like. Why does it look so different? If we look at this element, you can see that they're applying a font size of 80 pixels to it. So they're making it a lot larger. Font size, 80 pixels. You can see that they are making the, they're setting the weight of the font. They're making, they're making the font bolder. They're making it heavier, like it's been drawn with a heavier, a heavier pen. How about the one below it? Here we've got a smaller one. They've chosen to do an H4, which is interesting. And um, they're specifying a bunch of things about this as well. Uh, what, what would be worth calling out here? The fact that they're centering, centering this text. So you can see here how, um, you can see how the centering is being applied, etc. So lots of the simple things that we're learning this week how do I change the color? How do I change the background color? How do I center the text? How do I change the font? How do I change the font size? These are all the things that every website is doing. These are really, really common things that you're gonna do on tons and tons of websites that you're gonna be working on. Uh, is there anything else in here that's worth, worth checking out? It looks like they have a hover effect here. So when I'm hovering over these elements, you can see that as I put my mouse over top of this is probably a link. If I 
look at this, it is, it's a link. So in their CSS, they're gonna have a hover effect. So when, when hovering, the color gets changed, right? Change it to green. All right, let's see what else we can find out. So let's try a different website. Here you've got a site which is, it's got a really neat color palette. Like you can see, they've been very consistent with it through the photography, through the, the fonts, through the background colors and so on. A lot of earth tones and so on. It's really beautifully done. Different from what we saw before. You've got the footer, it's much lighter, right? But a lot of similarities. Like up at the top here, you have a banner across the top. You've got another call out at the top where they have a sale that's going on. Um, you have this main section here that's taking up the majority of the page and trying to get you to go to one of these two locations, shop for women, shop for men, etc. cetera. Um, what sorts of things can we find here? First of all, how are they loading their styles? This time, let's take a look at the network tab. So I'm gonna clear this and I'm gonna reload this page and let's see what loads. a lot loaded. So 6.9 megs worth of resources loaded, lots and lots on this page. First thing they load is a the website itself, the HTML. And then after that, we have JavaScript, 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 lots and lots of JavaScript. We've got a bunch of web fonts that are being loaded. Uh, let's see what they do for CSS. Here's their different CSS files here. I can filter those down and I can see that they're loading in multiple CSS files into this page. Okay. Um, so what all do we have here? So let's inspect some things like, for example, these sections here. Okay, this is really interesting. So these are clickable, which makes sense. You can click on this in order to go to a particular portion of the store. But what they're doing is they're restyling a button. So this entire thing is a button. So a button in HTML does not look like this. Um, an HTML button, it doesn't even look like this. <laughs> Uh, with no styles on it. I want, they've, they've done lots of styles to this. But a regular old HTML button, of course, now that I wanna show you one, I can't find one quickly. I could make one. Like these right here, you've seen tons and tons of buttons. Um, so I won't waste your time further with it. But it's interesting to see how much different they've made a button look. So they get the semantic effect of a button. A button is a very specific thing. A button can be clicked. A button has a lot of meaning. It has a lot of meaning for accessibility reasons in terms of the browser, in terms of the interaction. Like you can see that my mouse pointer has changed. Instead of being a cursor, when I cursor over this button, I get, I get a pointer and it says, this is a clickable element in the page. Very, very interesting. And they're specifying all sorts of different things in order to make this look the way that it looks. Fascinating. All right, what else have we got here? Um, let's take a look at the text here. So we've got across their nav, they're specifying the color is black and how about the background color? Background color, where does it get set? Higher up, presumably. Yep, here. So you can see, I don't know if you can, how well that comes through on the video, but as I toggle this on and off, you can see that the background color is being set and it's being set higher up on the DOM. So it's being set inside this class dot header underscore underscore menu bar and they're setting the background color. And that background color then gets inherited all the way down. So all of these different things use it. So when I get down to an anchor element, so this particular link that's in here, when I get into this and they specify 
a color and say, you know, this this is this color is black. It's black on top of the highlight color that's come from above, which is really good. How about this text here? How have they done it? So again, you can see the same sort of pattern that we just saw on the last website, which is the main text on this page is this right here. They make it really large. How do they make it large? So we have an H1 element. How do they style this? Here, where are they setting the font size? Font size here. So they make, the, they make it larger, right? They presumably are setting the font family. Let's see where. Font family has been inherited from above. So up above, they've maybe they've set it here. Yeah, here. So here they set the font family. So they decide which fonts they would prefer the browser to use. And you can see that they're giving a stack or a list of fonts that they want the browser to choose from. So I want you to use the circular font if it's available. Presumably this is a font that's being loaded, one of the web fonts that they loaded. Or if that's not available, use Helvetica. If Helvetica is not available, use Arial. And if Arial is not available, use whatever the sans serif font is that you have available in the browser. So they give this list. Here's all the fonts that I want I want to be used. Here's the size that I want to I want. Here's the um, the weight of the text, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, all the way down. Lots of basic things that you know, we're going to see repeated on all these different sites. Let's try one more. So here's blog to and what can we learn looking at this? So we've got at the top, we have all these links with hover effects. Let's see how they work. So here's my element and interested to see if they had, if they defined a hover effect for it. Let's just look at their CSS file and see. Yeah, okay, so they say that, what do they do on hover? On hover, they remove the underline. So they're saying uh, we have text decoration none, which is why they're, um, why you don't see a lot of, like you don't see an underline unless I put my mouse over top of the links. Like they're, they're hiding it until you hover over it. When you hover over it, they're putting in putting in the underline in order to make that work. That's interesting. How about these fonts? Let's have a look. So you can see there's a whole bunch of different fonts happening here. So they've got here, they have a very straight font. Like here they have a, a, a sans serif font. There's not a lot of curves and so on to it. But here you can see like the way that this F is or the way the T is, they have all of these little serifs. So they have a serif font for defined for this. So if we look here and try and figure out what font they're using. Yeah, you can see here, this is the font that they're using. So they're saying use Meriwether regular or Georgia or the serif font. And then they do this last little thing here and I don't think I mentioned this to you before. It's funny, they're doing it on all sorts of things. So one last piece of specificity that you can do with CSS is you can say, I have a rule that I would like to be applied. And this rule is important. It's so important that I want it to override other things that would happen in the page. 
So I want to make sure that this always gets set and I don't want something else to override me. So what you can do is you can add this exclamation important to the end of your value declaration here and that tells the browser that this is something you really want. Now, they're using it a lot, um, which is fascinating. So everything in here is important, important, important. I would suggest to you that you can usually get away without using it and it gives you some flexibility later on if you actually do need to override something. When you first build this, you say, I don't want, I don't ever want to override this, but then designs change, things change, and all of a sudden you're like, well, actually, I sort of need to be able to override this. How about this one here? Yeah, so here you can see they've got a whole font stack that's set, and it ends with sans serif. So they want to have their titles. You notice how their titles are sans serif, and then the body text is serif, which is a common, common pattern you're going to see lots of websites use because these serif fonts tend to be easier to read. When you're reading lots and lots of body text, they tend to be serif fonts. So what do they do? They set a font family. You can see the font family changing. They set a font size of 33 pixels. They change the line height. So you can see how they've just opened everything up a little bit. They've added more space. They're setting the color, which is also this, pretty much the same. It's black. It's hard to see the difference between the two of them so that it looks like this when you're in here. So they're playing with all of the things that we want to play with. White space, line heights, font selection, colors, um, playing with how heavy the font is, how small the font is, changing the width of things. You can see how they've they've got their content all in about this much space. They're not filling the whole screen. And they do this because the same way if you if you take out a book, like take out a novel uh, and look at how the text on a on the page is laid out, you're gonna see that you'll have what 10 to 15 words in a page, no more than that, because otherwise your head has to move too much as you're reading across, you're scanning left and right all the way through it. And here you're trying to keep it so that you don't, your just your eyes can move back and forth in order to be able to do this to go from one line to the next. Okay, so we've been able to take somebody else's web page, rip it apart, try and figure out how they've built it. Let's pause there and do this. I want you to do this all the time. Break open all kinds of websites that you think are cool or websites that you think are bad and see what makes them good or bad. But let's switch gears. I want to I want to go and I want to try and recreate this recreate this page here from this base HTML that I've got sitting in my browser. So I'll pause there. That's the last thing that I'll do with you in, in, in the next video.